Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Here's how our program is going to go this evening. We're going to start with a little half an hour or so, give or take five to ten minutes of uh, a time, and I'm going to give a little educational uh, background for you so that you kind of know where Mary of Egypt is in the story of, of God's people. And, uh, and then we're going to pray the beginning of Compline service in our Byzantine tradition. So for the first half an hour or so here, we're going to do this little educational piece and then Compline, which is night prayer. Okay. Um, and what does Compline consist of? Well, it consists of saying, Lord, have mercy on me, okay? Well, first of all, proclaiming how great God is and then asking for his mercy. So we're going to do what are called the Trisagium prayers. Um, and, uh, and you can just kind of follow along. We'll make vows, make the sign of the cross. We'll say the, uh, the, the, uh, what's called a, the smaller doxology or little doxology uh, and giving glory to God. We'll confess the creed, which I will lead. And then um, um, we'll have the life of Mary of Egypt in the middle of the Compline service. The life of Mary of Egypt takes about 35, well, about 40 minutes or so to read. And then we'll conclude Compline, the blessing for night, and go to bed. Okay? Let's begin in prayer together, okay? Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. In you, O Mother Mary, was restored the likeness of God. For you carried your cross and followed Christ. You taught by your deeds how to spurn the body, for it passes away. And how to value the soul, for it is immortal. Wherefore your soul is forever in happiness with the angels. To the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God. Have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Okay, for those that are just rolling in here, we'll start with a little uh, educational background here um, uh, on the life of St. Mary of Egypt before we begin our Compline service, night prayer, and the, and the reading of, of the life of St. Mary of Egypt. St. Mary lived uh, uh, sometime in the mid-4th century. I believe she was born around 344 and probably died around 421 at the age, right at about 75 years old, 80 years old. In that time, I ask you, especially our Institute of Catholic Culture family here joined together, What's going in the context whenever you read a story like this? What's going on in the life of the church? What's going on in society? So again, I give you those years. 344, she's born. So what kind of world does she enter into in the year 344? You ought to be saying to yourself, oh yeah, Father Hezekiah, that, that, those dates jump out at me because I know that those are the, date, those are the years of the early councils of the church, especially the years following the Council of Nicaea, and the great event which brought about the Council of Nicaea, well, the terrible event which was the advent of the Arian heresy, which I'm going to talk about, but maybe more important, the conversion of Constantine, uh, St. Constantine the Great, his conversion to Christianity. Constantine came to the throne, as you know, around the year 306, um, and faced a battle at the Milvian Bridge, 
in the year 312. Uh, he was terribly outnumbered in preparation for this battle, but uh, as he uh, laid in his bed that night, he was a given a vision. Then in the sky, he saw a cross and the words, by this sign, you will conquer. He then inscribed the cross upon the shields of his soldiers. They went into battle the next morning, and they won the battle. Following that battle, Constantine declared the Edict of Milan, giving freedom to Christianity. Up until that point, as you know, the persecution upon the Christian people was terrible. Uh, They were hunted. They were fed to the wild beasts. They were uh, stoned to death. They were, their heads were cut off. They were filleted. Their skin was taken from their bodies. They were burned alive. Following his conversion, uh, another event took place, and that was that a priest of the Patriarchate of Alexandria in Egypt, I should say a deacon at that time of Alexandria, proclaimed a terrible, terrible heresy. There in Alexandria, pay attention to that, because Mary of Egypt is going to come from that same city a few years later. And the deacon's name, as I said, was Arius. And his heretical teaching denied the fundamental teaching of the Holy Scriptures regarding the divinity of Christ, saying that Jesus was just a man. I have a quotation of what he, something he wrote. Listen to this. This is what I have learned from those endowed with wisdom, prominent men taught by God and skillful in all things. It is in their footsteps I myself walk. I walk like them. I, who am so much spoken against, and who have suffered so many things for the glory of God. Notice, notice he puts himself among those that are of great wisdom and prominent men. I, who have received from God the wisdom and knowledge which I possess. You know, you got the guy's going to have problems. Then he says this, God has not always been father. There was a moment when he was alone and was not yet father. Later he became so. The son is not from eternity. He came from nothing. Mm, So says the arch heretic Arius. And in 325, St. Constantine the Great called the Council of Nicaea gathering 318 bishops from around the world. And they resolutely condemned the arch heretic Arius and thrust him from the Catholic Church. However, all was not to be at peace, for his power grew day by day. St. Jerome says that the world awoke with a groan to find itself Arian. As the apostolic church had fought the Gnostic docetism before, which rejected the humanity of Christ, now the church of the fourth century had the opposite fight on its hands. And although St. Constantine, who died an Orthodox Christian, would be a decisive factor in the life of the church, his role was not always for good. For it wasn't long after the Council of Nicaea that Constantine began to side with the prevailing winds of Arianism that was sweeping through the church. And he even attempted to restore Arius to the church in a public ceremony in Constantinople. Fortunate for the church, in the midst of that procession to the great church in Constantinople, Arius turned aside from the procession, hid himself in a corner with deep 
pains, and by all accounts, his guts opened up and spilled out onto the ground, much like Judas, who had turned in our Lord. It is in this context that we receive and have even today a letter written by one of the bishops of Spain. His name was Hosius of Cordoba, uh, responding to a letter that Constantine had sent to all the bishops of the world following the Council of Nicaea when he began to defend Arius and condemn the great saint Athanasius, Athanasius. And this is what Hosius says in a letter replying to Constantine's attempt to dethrone St. Athanasius and lift up the archheretic Arius. The letter says this, Hosius to Constantine the emperor sends health in the Lord. I was a confessor at the first when a persecution arose in the time of, of your grandfather Maximian. And if you shall persecute me, I am ready now to, to endure anything rather than to shed innocent blood and to betray the truth. God has put into your hands the kingdom. To us, he has entrusted the affairs of his church. As he who would steal the empire from you would resist the ordinances of God, so likewise fear on your part, lest by taking upon yourself the government of the church, you become guilty of a great offense. It is written, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Neither, therefore, is it permitted unto us to exercise an earthly rule, nor have you, sire, any authority to burn incense. These things I write unto you out of a concern for your salvation. With regard to the subject of your letter, so this is the bishop responding to Constantine's letter. With regard to the subject of your letter, this is my determination. I will not unite myself to the Arians. I anathematize their heresy. Neither will I subscribe against Athanasius, whom both we and the Church of the Romans and the whole council pronounced to be guiltless. Okay. Well, the Church fought for its life in the face of this heresy. The Roman army continued to crumble under increasing licentiousness. I have a quotation to share with you from Dr. Warren Carroll, who is a great historian now reposed in the Lord. He says, the decline of, the, of its population, speaking of the Roman Empire, the decline of its population was steady, steep, and long-standing. Economic conditions were going from bad to worse almost everywhere within it. Taxation, where it could be enforced at all, was confiscatory and ruinous, despite attempts were made to, to bind every man and his descendants forever by law to the particular work that that man did now. Most of what wealth still existed was secretly hoarded or, con or, or concentrated in the hands of a few powerful enough to be able to manipulate or defy the government. Public spirit was dead, and most Romans were no longer willing to fight, and they hired barbarians to fight for them. Worst of all was the moral enervation that took away the very qualities of the spirit that alone could have sparked a revival, a social acceptance and constant encouragement in the most depraved pleasures gazing enthralled at the bloody slaughters in the arena, openly indulging in every form of sexual vice, frequent attendance at, at those banquets of mo monstrous gluttony, which required the vomitoria, where the guests went to degorge one meal so that they could eat another. Carol goes on, For good Christians, only two reactions were now possible. Both occurred widely. One was simply to do one's duty, however infrequently or poorly others were doing theirs, trusting in God and disregarding the, the imminence of disaster. That was the way the bishops who became saints 
of here and there an honest Christian official and undoubtedly of many simple laymen unknown to history. The classic example of St. Augustine in his mid-70s, still at his post at Hippo among his frightened flock while the all-conquering vandals besieged the city until he died. The other way was to humanize very different, indeed appearing to be contradictory, antisocial, escapist, yet in the Christian economy, it was profoundly needed and an enormous benefit. It was the way of the monk, the athlete of Christ. These two ways, these two ways described by Carol are exemplified by two great men, that the, two of the greatest men the church has ever known. St. Athanasius, patriarch of Alexandria, who fought publicly against the heresy of Arianism. And the other way, by St. Anthony the Great, who lived in the deserts of Egypt at the time, living in the years 251 to 356. He went out into the desert not to fight Arius, but to fight the real enemy of Christ, the devil himself. Both fought and suffered greatly. Dr. Carroll sums up his comments in this way. Monastic communities of all kinds, along with the hermitages of the solitary monks and anchorites, dotted the desert reaches of Egypt, Palestine, and Syria by the late 4th century, and had spread to the rock caves of Cappadocia and the forested hills and coastlands of Italy and Gaul. Many pagans and lax Christians hated the monks whose life was a standing repudiation and condemnation of all that such men had lived for. We can sum up these comments in this way. Men fled into the desert in droves, both to avoid the licentious life of the city and to become what we would call today white martyrs. In lieu of the persecutions that had plagued the church in the early days, men sought another type of witness. They fled to Christ in the desert to live a solitary life, to struggle for Christ, and eventually to form communities. It is in this context that we meet St. Mary of Egypt in the context of an empire in crisis. Converted to Christ, but riddled with heresy, slouching toward Gomorrah, and at the same time prostrate before Christ. My brothers and sisters, we'll begin now our life of Mary of Egypt, which is placed in the context of Great Compline. For the many visitors that we have with us this evening, uh, the first part of this service it t- will take about 10 or 15 minutes. It will consist of Uh, uh, of bowing down before the Lord, making the sign of the cross, um, and and, and chanting a few prayers, including the creed, following which we will read the life of Mary of Egypt together. At the end of the life of Mary of Egypt, then we will conclude night prayer with a blessing for everyone. The conclusion will take about 15 minutes, um, and uh, and then we will retire for the evening. I will have an opportunity at the end of the Compline service for anyone that would like to stay around for a little bit of question and answer. Let us begin our service of Compline, and uh, in the midst of which we will read the life of St. Mary of Egypt. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Glory to you, our God, glory to you, heavenly King, consoler, spirit of truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life. Come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy mortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy mortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy mortal one, have mercy on us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto each of the ages, amen. 
All Holy Trinity of mercy on us, Lord, forgive us our sins, Master, pardon our transgressions. Holy One, look upon us and heal our infirmities for your name's sake. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto each of the ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Lord, have Lord have mercy, 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 Lord have mercy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto each of the beach. Amen. Come, let us worship God, our King, and bow down before him. Come, let us worship Christ God, our King, and bow down before him. Come, let us worship Christ our King and our God, and bow down before him. O God, have mercy on me in the greatness of your love, in the abundance of your tender mercies. Wipe out my offense, wash me thoroughly from malice, and cleanse me from sin, for I am well aware of my malice, and my sin is before me always. It is you alone I have offended. I have done what is evil in your sight. Wherefore, you are just in your deeds and triumphant in your judgment. Behold, I was born in iniquities, and in my sins my mother conceived me. But you are the lover of truth. You have shown me depths and secrets of your wisdom. Wash me with hyssop, and I shall be pure. Cleanse me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear sounds of joy and feasting. The bones that were afflicted shall rejoice. Turn your face away from my offenses, and wipe off all my sins. A spotless heart create in me, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit in my breast. Cast me not afar from your face. Take not your blessed spirit out of me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and let your guiding spirit dwell in me. I will teach your ways to the sinners and the wicked shall return to you. Deliver me from blood guilt, O God, my saving God, and my tongue will joyfully sing your justice. O Lord, you shall open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Had you desired sacrifice, I would have offered it but you will not be satisfied with whole burnt offerings. Sacrifice to God is a contrite spirit, a crushed and humbled heart God will not spurn. In your kindness, O Lord, be bountiful to Zion. May the walls of Jerusalem be restored. Then will you delight in just oblation, in sacrifice and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer calves upon your altar. O God, come to my assistance. O Lord, hasten to help me. Shame and disgrace upon those who seek my life. Let them turn back and be confounded, who wish me evil. Let them now turn in shame, who jeer at me. Well done, well done. But let all who search for you be glad and rejoice in you. And let those who love your salvation, O God, always say, The Lord be exalted. As for me, I am wretched and poor. God shall be my help. You are indeed my help and my salvation. O Lord, tarry not. O Lord, listen to my prayer. In truth, give heed to my request. And in your justice, hear me. And enter not into judgment with your servant. Since of all the living, none is just before you. The enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life into the ground. He has forced me to dwell in darkness like those long dead. My spirit was overwhelmed with grief, and within me my heart was troubled. Remembering the days of old, I meditated on all your deeds. I thought of the works of your hands. I stretched out my hands to you. Like a parched land, my soul longed for you. Listen to me without delay, O Lord. My spirit has failed me. Turn not your face away from me, nor let me sink in the pit like the others. Grant that I may hear your love at dawn. For I have placed my hope in you. 
O Lord, let me know which way I shall go, for I have lifted up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. It is to you that I have fled. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me over level ground. For the sake of your name, O Lord, you will keep me alive. In your saving bounty, you will deliver my soul from oppression. And in your loving kindness, you will destroy my enemies and bring to naught all those who grieve my soul. For I am your servant. Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace and goodwill to men. We sing to you, we bless you, we worship you, we glorify you, we give thanks to you for the splendor of your glory. O Lord, King, O Heavenly God, Father Almighty, O Lord, Only Begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and you all, Holy Spirit. O Lord, God, O Lamb of God, O Son of the Father, who take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. O you who take away the sins of the world. Accept our supplication, O you who are enthroned at the right hand of the Father, and have mercy on us. For you alone are holy, you alone are the Lord Jesus Christ, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Every day will I bless you and sing to your name always and forever and ever. O Lord, you have been for us a refuge from age to age. I said, Lord, have mercy on me and heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. O Lord, to you do I come for shelter. Teach me to obey your will, for you are my God. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we shall see light. Extend your mercy upon those who confess you. Deign, O Lord, to keep us this night without sin. Blessed are you, O Lord, God of our fathers. Praised and glorified is your name forever. Amen. O Lord, let your mercy rest upon us, for we have placed our trust in you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. Blessed are you, O Master, grant that I may understand your statutes. Blessed are you, O Holy One, enlighten me with your statutes. Everlasting is your love, O Lord, turn not away from the work of your hands. Indeed, praise that of church and glory are your due, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit now and ever and unto ages of ages amen i believe in one god father almighty creator of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible and in one lord jesus christ the only begotten son of god begotten of the father before all ages light of light true god of true god begotten not made of one substance with the father by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man, who was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried, who rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is enthroned at the right hand of the Father, who will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, and of whose kingdom there shall be no end, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke to the prophets in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I profess one baptism for the remission of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. It is good to hide the secret of a king, but it is glorious to reveal and preach the works of God. So said the archangel Raphael to Tobit when he performed the wonderful healing of his blindness. Actually, not to keep the secret of a king as perilous and a terrible risk, but to be silent about the works of God is a great loss for the soul. And I, says St. Sophronius, in writing the life of St. Mary of Egypt, am afraid to hide the works of God by silence. Remembering the misfortune threatened to the servant who hid his God-given talent in the earth, I am bound to pass on the holy account that has reached me, and let no one think, continues St. Sophronius, that I have had the audacity to write untruth or doubt this great marvel. May I never lie about holy things. There do happen to be people who, after reading this account, do not believe it, May the Lord have mercy on them. 
because reflecting on the weakness of human nature, they consider impossible these wonderful things accomplished by holy people. But now we must begin to tell this most amazing story which has taken place in our generation. There was a certain elder in the, one of the monasteries of Palestine, a priest of holy life and speech, who from childhood had been brought up in monastic ways and customs. The elder's name was Zosimus. He had been through the whole course of the ascetic life, and in everything he adhered to the rule once given to him by his tutors as regards <coughs> spiritual labors. He had also added a great deal himself while laboring to subject his flesh to the will of the Spirit. And he had not failed in his aim. He was so renowned for his spiritual life that, came, that many came to him from neighboring monasteries, and some even from afar. While doing all of this, he never ceased to study, study the divine scriptures, whether resting, standing, working, or eating food, if the scraps he nibbled could be called food. He incessantly and constantly had a single aim, always to sing of God and to practice the teachings of the divine scriptures. Zosimus used to relate how as soon as he was taken from his mother's breast, he was handed over to the monastery where he went through his training as an ascetic till he reached the age of 53. After that, he began to be tormented with the thought that he was perfect in everything and needed no instruction from anyone, saying to himself mentally, Is there a monk on earth who can be of use to me and show me a kind of asceticism that I have not accomplished? Is there a man to be found in the desert who has surpassed me? Thus thought the elder when suddenly an angel appeared to him and said, Zosimus valiantly, have you struggled as far as this is within the power of man? Valiantly have you gone through the ascetic course? But there is no man who has attained perfection. Before you lie unknown struggles greater than those you have already accomplished, that you may know how many other ways lead to salvation. Leave your native land like the renowned patriarch Abraham and go to the monastery by the river Jordan. Zosimus did as he, as he was told. He left the monastery in which he had lived from childhood and went to the river Jordan. At last he reached the community to which God had sent him. Having knocked at the door of the monastery, he told the monk who was the porter who he was, and the porter told the abbot. On being admitted to the abbot's presence, Zosimus made the usual monastic prostration and prayer. Seeing that he was a monk, the abbot asked, Where do you come from, brother? And why have you come to us poor old men? Zosimus replied, There is no need to speak about where I have come from, but I have come, Father, seeking spiritual profit, for I have heard great things about your skill in leading souls to God. Brother, the abbot said, Only God can heal the infirmity of the soul. May he teach you and us his divine ways and guide us. But as it is the love of Christ that has moved you to visit us poor old men and stay with us, if that is why you have come. May the good shepherd who laid down his life for our salvation fill us all with the grace of the Holy Spirit. After this, Zosimus bowed to the abbot, asked for his prayers and blessings, and stayed in the monastery. There he saw elders proficient, both in action and the contemplation of God, a flame in the Spirit working for the Lord. They sang incessantly, they stood in prayer all night. Work was ever in their hands and psalms on their lips. Never an idle word was heard among them. They knew nothing about acquiring temporal goods or the cares of life. But they had one desire to become in body like corpses. Their constant food was the word of God and they sustained their bodies on bread and water. As much as their love for God allowed them. Seeing this, Zosimus was greatly edified, prepared for the struggle that laid before him. Many days passed, and the time drew near when all Christians fast and prepare themselves to worship the divine passion and resurrection of Christ. The monastery gates were kept always locked and only opened when one of the community was sent out on some errand. 
It was a desert place, not only unvisited by people of the world, but even unknown to them. There was a rule in that monastery, which was the reason why God brought Zosimus there. At the beginning of the great fast on Forgiveness Sunday, the priest celebrated the holy liturgy and all partook of the holy body and blood of Christ. After the liturgy, they went to the refectory and would eat a little Lenten food. Then all gathered in the church, and after praying earnestly with prostrations, the elders kissed one another and asked forgiveness. And each made a prostration to the abbot and asked his blessing and prayers for the struggle that lay before them. After this, the gates of the monastery were thrown open, and singing, The Lord is my light and my Savior, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defender of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? And the rest of that psalm all went out into the desert and crossed the river Jordan. Only one or two brothers were left in the monastery, not to guard the property, for there was nothing to rob, but so as not to leave the church without divine services. Each took with him as much as he could or wanted in the way of food, according to the needs of his body. One would take a little bread, another some figs, another dates or wheat soaked in water. And some took nothing but their own body covered with rags and fed when nature forced them to it on the plants that grew in the desert. After the crossing of the Jordan, they all scattered far and wide in different directions. And this was the rule of life they had, in which they all observed, neither to talk to one another or to know how each one lived and fasted. If they did happen to catch sight of one another, they went to another part of the country, living alone and always singing to God, and at a definite time eating a very small quantity of food. In this way, they spent the whole of the fast and used to return to the monastery a week before the resurrection of Christ on Palm Sunday. Each one returned having his own conscience as a witness of his labor. And no one asked another how he had spent his time in the desert. Such were the rules of the monastery. Every one of them, while in the desert, struggled with himself for, for the judge of the struggle. God, not seeking to please men and fast before the eyes of all, for what is done for the sake of men to win praise and honor is not only useless to the one who does it, but sometimes the cause of great punishment. Zosimus did the same as all. And he went far, far into the desert with a secret hope of finding some father who might be living there and who might be able to satisfy his thirst and longing. He wandered on tirelessly as if hurrying on to some def definite place. He'd already walked for 20 days. And when the sixth hour came, he stopped. And turning to the east, he began to sing the sixth hour, recite the customary prayers. He used to break his journey thus at fixed hours of the day to rest a little, to chant psalms standing, and to pray on bent knees. And as he sang thus without turning his eyes from the heavens, he suddenly saw to the right of the hillock on which he stood the semblance of a human body. At first he was confused, thinking he beheld a vision of the devil, and even started with fear, but having guarded himself with the sign of the cross, and banished all fear, he turned his gaze in that direction, and in truth, he saw some form gliding southward. It was naked, the skin dark, as if burned up by the heat of the sun. The hair on its head was white as a fleece, and not long, falling just below its neck. Zosimus was so overjoyed at beholding a human form that he ran after it in pursuit. But the form fled from him. He followed. At length, when he was near enough to be heard, he shouted, Why do you run from an old man and a sinner? Slave of the true God, wait for me. Whoever you are in God's name, I tell you, for the love of God, for whose sake you are living in the desert. Forgive me for God's sake, but I cannot turn towards you and show you my face, Abba Zosimus, for I am a woman and naked as you see, with the uncovered shame of my body. But if you would like to fulfill one wish of a sinful woman, 
throw me your cloak that I can cover my body and can turn to you and ask for your blessing. Here, terror seized Zosimus, for he heard that she called him by name, but he realized that she could not have done so without knowing anything of him if she had not the power of spiritual insight. He at once did as he was asked. He took off his old tattered cloak and threw it to her. Turning away as he did so, she picked it up and was able to cover at least a part of her body. Then she turned to Zosimus and said, Why did you wish Abba Zosimus to see a sinful woman? What do you wish to hear or learn from me? You who have not shrunk from such great struggles. Zosimus <laughs> threw himself on the ground and asked for her blessing. She likewise bowed down before him, and thus they lay on the ground prostrate, asking for each other's blessing. And one word alone could be heard from both, bless me. After a while, the woman said to Zosimus, Abba Zosimus, it is you who must give blessing and pray. You are dignified by the order of priesthood. For many years you have been standing standing before the holy altar and offering the sacrifice of the divine mysteries. This flung Zosimus into even greater terror. At length with tears, he said to her, O mother, filled with the spirit, by your mode of life, it is evident that you live with God and have died to the world. The grace granted to you is apparent. For you have called me by name and recognized that I am a priest, though you have never seen me before. Grace is recognized not by one's orders, but by gifts of the Spirit. So give me your blessing for God's sake, for I need your prayers. Then, giving way before the wish of the elder, the woman said, Blessed is God who cares for the salvation of men and their souls. Zosimus answered, Amen, and both rose to their feet. Then the woman asked the elder, Why have you come, man of God, to me who am so sinful? Why do you wish to see a woman naked and devoid of every virtue? Though I know one thing, the grace of the Holy Spirit has brought you to render me a service in time. Tell me, Father, how are the Christian people living? And the kings, how is the church guided? Zosimus said, By your prayers, Mother Christ has granted lasting peace to all, but fulfill the, the unworthy petition of an old man and pray for the whole world and for me who am a sinner, so that my wanderings in the desert may not be fruitless. She answered, you are a priest, Abba Zosimus. It is you who must pray for me and for all, for this is your calling. But as we must all be obedient, I will gladly do what you ask. And with these words, she turned to the east, and raising her eyes to heaven, stretched, stretching out her hands, she began to pray in a whisper. One could not hear separate words, so that Zosimus could not understand anything that she said in her prayers. Meanwhile, he stood, according to his own word, all in a flutter, looking at the ground without saying a word. And he swore, calling God to witness, that when at length he thought that her prayer was very long, he took his eyes off the ground and saw that she was raised about a four arms distance from the ground and stood praying in the air. When he saw this, even greater terror seized him, and he fell on the ground weeping and repeating many times, Lord, have mercy. And while lying prostrate on the ground, he was tempted by a thought. Is it not a spirit and perhaps her prayer is hypocrisy? But at the very same moment, the woman turned round, raised the elder from the ground, and said, Why do thoughts confuse you, Abba, and tempt you about me, as if I were a spirit and a dissembler in prayer? Know, Holy Father, that I am only a sinful woman, though I am guarded by holy baptism, and I am no spirit but earth and ashes and flesh alone. And with these words, she guarded herself with the sign of the cross on her forehead, eyes, mouth, and breast, saying, May God defend us from the evil one and from his designs, for fierce is his struggle against us. Hearing and seeing this, the elder fell to the ground, and embracing her feet, he said to her with tears, 
I beg you by the name of Christ our God, who was born of a virgin, for whose sake you have stripped yourself, for whose sake you have exhausted your flesh, do not hide from your slave who you are and whence and how you came into this desert. Tell me everything so that the marvelous works of God may become known. A hidden wisdom and a secret treasure, what profit is there in them? Tell me all, I implore you, for not out of vanity or for self-display will you speak, but to reveal the truth to me, an unworthy sinner. I believe in God for whom you live and whom you serve. I believe that he led me into this desert so as to show me his ways in regards to you. It is not in our power to resist the plans of God. If it were not the will of God that you and your life would be known, he would not have allowed me to see you and would not have strengthened me to undertake this journey, one like me who never before dared to leave his cell. Much more, said Abba Zosimus, but the woman raised him and said, I am ashamed, Abba, to speak to you of my disgraceful life. Forgive me for God's sake, but as you have already seen my naked body, I shall likewise lay be bare before you my work, so that you may know with what shame and obscenity my soul is filled. I was not running away out of vanity, as you thought, for what have I to be proud of, I who was the chosen vessel of the devil? But when I start my story, you will run from me as from a snake. For your ears will not be able to bear the vileness of my actions. But I shall tell you all without hiding anything, only imploring you first of all to pray incessantly for me, so that I may find mercy on the day of judgment. The elder wept, and the woman began her story. My native land, Holy Father, was Egypt. Already during the lifetime of my parents, when I was 12 years old, I renounced their love and went to Alexandria. I am ashamed to recall how there I at first ruined my maidenhood, and then unrestrainedly and insatiably gave myself up to it sens sensuality. It is more becoming to speak of this briefly so that you may just know my passion and lechery. For about 17 years, forgive me, I lived like that. I was like a, f a fire of public debauch. And it was not for the sake of gain. Here I speak pure truth. Often when they wished to pay me, I refused the money. I acted in this way so as to make as many men as possible try to obtain me doing free of charge what gave me pleasure. Do not think that I was rich, or that was the reason why I did not take money. I lived by begging, often by spinning flax, but I had an insatiable desire and an irrepressible passion for lying in filth. This was my life. Every kind of abuse of nature I regarded as life. That is how I lived. Then one summer I saw a large crowd of Libyans and Egyptians running toward the sea. I asked one of them, where are these men hurrying to? He replied, they are all going to Jerusalem for the exaltation of the precious and life-giving cross, which takes place in a few days. I, I said to him, will they take me with them if I wish to go? No one will hinder you if you have money to pay for the journey and for food. And I said to him, to tell you the truth, I have no money, neither have I food, but I shall go with them and I shall go aboard and they shall feed me whether they want to or not. I have a body. They shall take it instead of pay for the journey. I was suddenly filled with a desire to go, Abba, to have more lovers who could satisfy my passion. I told you, Abba Zosimus, not to force me to tell you of my disgrace. God is my witness. I am afraid of defiling you and the very air with my words. Zosimus, weeping, replied to her, Speak on for God's sake, mother. Speak and do not break the thread of such an edifying tale. And resuming her story, she went on. That youth on hearing my shameful words laughed and went off while I, throwing away my spinning wheel, ran off toward the sea in the direction which everyone seemed to be taking. 
And seeing some young men standing at the shore, about 10 or more of them, full of vigor and alert in their movements, I decided that they would do for my purpose. It seemed that some of them were waiting for more travelers while others had gone ashore. Shamelessly as usual, I mixed with the crowd, saying, Take me with you to the place where you are going to. You will not find me superfluous. I also added a few more words calling forth general laughter. Seeing my readiness to be shameless, they readily took me aboard the boat. Those who were expected came also, and we set sail at once. How shall I relate to you what happened after this? Whose tongue can tell, whose ears can take in all that took place on the boat during that voyage. And to all of this, I frequently vo- forced those miserable youths against their very own will. There is no mentionable or unmentionable depravity of which I was not their teacher. I am amazed, Abba, how the sea stood our licentiousness, how the earth did not open its jaws, and how it was that hell did not swallow me alive, when I had entangled in my net so many souls. But I think God was seeking my repentance, for he does not desire the death of a sinner, but magnanimously awaits his return to him. At last we arrived in Jerusalem. I spent the days before the festival in the town living the same kind of life, perhaps even worse. I was not content with the youths I had seduced at sea and who had helped me to get to Jerusalem. Many others, citizens of the town and foreigners, I also seduced. The holy day of the exaltation of the cross dawned while I was still flying about hunting for youths and at daybreak. I saw that everyone was hurrying to the church, so I ran with the rest. When the hour for the holy elevation approached, I was trying to make my way in with the crowd, which was struggling to get through the church doors. I at last squeezed through with great difficulty, almost at the entrance of the temple, from which the life-giving tree of the cross was being shown to the people. But when I trod in the doorstep, which everyone passed, I was stopped by the same force which presented my, prevented my entering. Meanwhile, I was brushed aside by the crowd and found myself standing alone in the porch. Thinking that this had happened because of my woman's weakness, I again began to work my way into the crowd, trying to elbow myself forward. But in vain I struggled. Again, my feet trod on the doorstep over which the others were entering the church without encountering any obstacle. I alone seemed to remain unaccepted by the church. It was as if there was a detachment of soldiers standing there to oppose my entrance. Once again, I was excluded by the same mighty force, and again I stood in the porch. Having repeated my attempt three or four times, at last I felt exhausted and had no more strength to push and to be pushed. So I went aside and stood in the corner of the porch, and only then with great difficulty it began to dawn on me, and I began to understand the reason why I was prevented from being admitted to see the life-giving cross. The words of salvation gently touched the eyes of my heart and revealed to me that it was my unclean life which barred the entrance to me. I began to weep and lament and beat my breast, to sigh from the depth of my heart. So I stood weeping when I saw above me the icon of the most holy mother of God and turning to her my bodily and spiritual eyes, I said, O lady mother of God who gave birth in the flesh to God the word, I know, oh, how, I know how well I know that it is no honor or praise to thee when one so impure and depraved as I look up to thy icon, O ever virgin who didst keep thy body and soul in purity. Rightly do I inspire hatred and disgust before thy virginal purity. But I have heard that God who was born of thee became man on purpose to call sinners to repentance. Then help me, for I have no other help. Order the entrance of the church to be open to me. Allow me to see the venerable tree on which he who was born of thee suffered in the flesh and on which he shed his holy blood for the redemption of sinners, and for me, an unworthy as I am. Be my faithful witness before thy son that I will never again defile my body by the impurity of fornication, 
And as soon as I have seen the tree of the cross, I will renounce the world and its temptations and will go wherever thou will lead me. Thus I spoke, and as if acquiring some hope and firm faith and feeling some confidence in the mercy of the mother of God, I left the place where I stood praying, and I went again and mingled with the crowd that was pushing its way into the temple. And no one seemed to thwart me. No one hindered my entering the church. I was possessed with trembling and was almost in delirium, having got as far as the doors which I could not reach before, as if the same force which had hindered me cleared the way for me. I now entered without difficulty and found myself within the holy place. And so it was, I saw the life-giving cross. I saw, too, the mysteries of God and how the Lord accepts repentance. Throwing myself on the ground, I worshipped that holy earth and kissed it with trembling. Then I came out of the church and went to her who had promised to be my security, to the place where she had sealed my vow. Bending my knees before the Virgin Mother of God, I addressed to her such words as these, O loving lady, thou hast shown me thy great love for all men. Glory to God who receives the repentance of sinners through thee. What more can I recollect or say? I who am so sinful. It is time for me, O lady, to fulfill my vow according to thy witness. Now lead me by the hand along the path of repentance. And at these words, I heard a voice from on high. If you cross the Jordan, you will find glorious rest. Hearing this voice and having faith that it was for me, I cried to the mother of God. O oh, lady, lady, do not forsake me. With these words, I left the porch of the church and set off on my journey. As I was leaving the church, a stranger glanced at me and gave me three coins saying, sister, take these. And taking the money, I bought three loaves and took them with me on my journey as a blessed gift. I asked the person who sold the bread, which is the way to the Jordan? I was directed to the city gate, which led that way. Running on, I passed the gates and still weeping, went on my journey. Those I met, I asked the way. And after walking the rest of that day, I think it was nine o'clock when I saw the cross. I at length reached at sunset the church of St. John the Baptist, which stood on the banks of the Jordan. After praying in the temple, I went down to the Jordan and rinsed my face and hands in the holy waters. And I partook of the holy and life-giving mysteries in the church of the forerunner and ate half of one of my loaves. Then, after drinking some water from the Jordan, I lay down and passed the night on the ground. In the morning, I found a small boat and crossed to the opposite bank. I again prayed to Our Lady to lead me whither she wished. Then I found myself in this desert, and since then, up to this very day, I am estranged from all, keeping away from people and running away from everyone. And I live here clinging to my God who saves all who turn to him from faint-heartedness and storms. Zosima asked her, How many years have gone by since you began to live in this desert? She replied, 47 years have already gone by, I think, since I left the holy city. Zosimus asked, but what food do you find? The woman said, I had two and a half loaves when I crossed the Jordan. Soon they dried up and became hard as rock. Eating a little, I gradually finished them after a few years. Zosima asked, can it be that without getting ill, you have lived so many years thus? without suffering in any way from such a complete change? The woman answered, You remind me, Zosimus, of what I dare not speak of. For when I recall all the dangers which, overcame, which I overcame and all the violent thoughts which confused me, I am again afraid that they will take possession of me. Zosimus said, Do not hide from me anything. Speak to me without concealing anything. She said to him, Believe me, Abba, 17 years I passed in this desert fighting wild beasts, mad desires, and passions. When I was about to partake of food, I used to begin to regret the meat and fish which I, with which I had so much in Egypt. 
I regretted also not having wine, which I loved so much, for I drank a lot of wine when I lived in the world, while here I had not even water. I used to burn and succumb with thirst. The mad desire for profligate songs also entered me and confused me greatly, edging me on to sing satanic songs which I had learned once. But when such desires entered me, I struck myself on the breast and reminded myself of the vow which I had made when going into the desert. In my thoughts, I returned to the icon of the mother of God, which had received me. And to her, I cried in prayer. I implore, I implored her to chase away the thoughts to which my miserable soul was succumbing. And after weeping for long and beating my breast, I used to see light at last which seemed to shine on me from everywhere. And after the violent storm, lasting calm descended. And how can I tell you about the thoughts which urged me on to fornication? How can I express them to you, Abba? A fire was kindled in my miserable heart, which seemed to burn me up completely and to awake in me a thirst for embraces. As soon as this craving came to me, I flung myself to the earth and watered it with my tears, as if I saw before me my witness, who had appeared to me in my disobedience and who seemed to threaten punishment for the crime. And I did not rise from the ground. Sometimes I lay thus prostrate for a day and a night, till a calm and sweet light descended and enlightened me and chased away the thoughts that possessed me. But always I turned to the eyes, of, the eyes of my mind to my protectress, asking her to extend help to one who was sinking fast in the waves of the desert. I always had her as my helper and the acceptor of my repentance. And thus I lived for 17 years amid constant dangers. And since then, even till now, the mother of God helps me in everything and leads me, as it were, by the hand. Zosimus asked, can it be that you did not need food or clothing? She answered, after finishing the loaves I had, of which I spoke for 17 years, I have fed on herbs and all that can be found in the desert. The clothes I had when I crossed the Jordan became torn and worn out. I suffered greatly from the cold and greatly from the extreme heat. At times the sun burned me up, and at other times I shivered from the frost. And frequently falling to the ground, I lay without breath and without motion. I struggled with many afflictions and with terrible temptations. But from that time till now, the power of God in numerous ways has guarded my sinful soul and my humble body. When I only reflect on the evils from which our Lord has delivered me, I have imper imperishable food for hope of salvation. I am fed and clothed by the all-powerful word of God, the Lord of all. For it is not by bread alone that man lives, and those who have stripped off the rags of sin have no refuge, hiding themselves in the clefts of the rocks. Hearing that she cited the words of Scripture, from Moses and Job, Zosimus asked her, And so have you read the Psalms and other books? She smiled at this and said to the elder, Believe me, I have not seen a human face ever since I crossed the Jordan, except yours today. I have not seen a beast or a living being ever since I came into the desert. I never learned from books. I have never even heard anyone who sang or read from them. But the word of God, which is alive and active by itself, teaches a man knowledge. And so this is the end of my tale. But as I asked you in the beginning, so even now I implore you for the sake of the incarnate word of God to pray to the Lord for me, who am such a sinner. Thus concluding her tale, she bowed, her down, she bowed down before him and with tears the elder exclaimed, Blessed is God who creates the great and wondrous, the glorious and marvelous without end. Blessed is God who has shown me how he rewards those who fear him. Truly, O Lord, thou dost not forsake those who seek thee. And the woman, not allowing the elder to bow down before her, said, I beg you, Holy Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, tell no one what you have heard until God delivers me of this earth. And now depart in peace, 
And again, next year you shall see me, and I you, if God will preserve us in his great mercy. But for God's sake, do as I ask. Next year during Lent, do not cross the Jordan, as is your custom in the monastery. Zosimus was amazed to hear that she knew the rules of the monastery and could only say glory to God who bestows great gifts on those who love him. She continued, remain Abba in the monastery, and even if you wish to depart, you will not be able to do so. And at sunset of the holy day of the Last Supper, put some of the life-giving body and blood of Christ into a holy vessel worthy to hold such mysteries for me, and bring it. And wait for me on the banks of the Jordan, adjoining the inhabited parts of the land, so that I can come and partake of the life-giving gifts. For since the time I communicated in the temple of the forerunner, before crossing the Jordan even to this day, I have not approached the holy mysteries, and I thirst for them with an irrepressible love and longing. And therefore I ask and implore you to grant me my wish, Bring me the life-giving mysteries at the very hour when our Lord made his disciples partake of his divine supper. Tell John, the abbot of the monastery, where you live. Look to yourself and to your brothers, for there is much that needs correction. Only do not say this now, but when God guides you, pray for me. With these words, she vanished in the, de- in the depths of the desert, and Zosimus falling down on his knees and bowing down to the ground, on which she had stood, sent up glory and thanksgiving to God. And after wandering through the desert, he returned to the monastery on the day all the brothers returned. For the whole year he kept silent, not daring to tell anyone of what he had seen. But in this should he pray to God to give him another chance of seeing the ascetic's dear face. And when at length the first Sunday of the great fast came, all went out into the desert with the customary pr- prayers and the singing of psalms. Only Zosimus was held back by illness. He lay in a fever. And then he remembered what the saint had said. And even if you wish to depart, you will not be able to do so. When many days passed and at last recovering from his illness, he remained in the monastery. And, the, and when attain, the monks returned, when at last the monks returned, And the day of the Last Supper dawned, he did as he had been ordered. And placing some of the most pure body and blood into a small chalice and putting some figs and dates and lentils soaked in water into a small basket, he departed for the desert and reached the banks of the Jordan and sat down to wait for the saint. He waited for a long while and then began to doubt. Then raising his eyes to heaven, He began to pray, grant me, O Lord, to behold that which thou hast allowed me to behold once. Do not let me depart in vain, bearing the burden of my sins. And then another thought struck him. And what if she does not come? There is no boat. How will she cross the Jordan to come to me, who am so unworthy? And as he was pondering thus, he saw the holy woman appear and stand on the other side of the river. Zosimus got up, rejoicing and glorifying and thanking God. And again the thought came to him that she could not cross the Jordan. Then he saw that she made the sign of the cross over the waters of the Jordan. The night was a moonlit one, for he relayed, as he related afterwards. And then she at once stepped onto the waters and began walking across the surface toward him. And when... He wanted to prostrate himself. She cried to him while still walking on the water. What are you doing, Abba? You are a priest carrying the divine gifts. He obeyed her, and on reaching the shore, she said to the elder, Bless, Father, bless me. He answered her trembling, for a state of confusion had overcome him at the sight of the miracle. Truly God did not lie when he promised that when we purify ourselves, we shall be like him. Glory to thee, Christ our God, who has shown me through this thy slave how far away I stand from perfection. 
Here the woman asked him to say the creed and the Our Father. He began and she finished the prayers. And according to the custom of that time, gave him the kiss of peace on the lips. Having partaken of the holy mysteries, she raised her hands to heaven and sighed with tears in her eyes, exclaiming, Now lettest thou thyself depart in peace, O Lord, according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. Then she said to the elder, Forgive me, Abba, for asking you, but fulfill another wish of mine. Go now to the monastery and let God's grace guard you. And next year, come again to the same place where I first met you. Come for God's sake, for you shall again see me, for such is the will of God. He said to her, from this day on, I would like to follow you and always see your holy face. But now fulfill the one and only wish of an old man and take a little of the food I have brought for you. He showed her the basket. While she touched the lentils with the tips of her fingers and taking three grains, said that the Holy Spirit guards the substance of the soul unpolluted. And then she said, pray for for God's sake for me and remember a miserable wretch. Touching the saint's feet and asking for her prayers for the church, the kingdom and himself, he let her depart with tears while he went off sighing and sorrowful for he could not hope to vanquish the invincible. Meanwhile, she again made the sign of the cross over the Jordan and stepped onto the waters and crossed over as before. And the elder returned filled with joy and terror, accusing himself of not having asked the saint her name, but he decided to do so next year. When another year had passed, he again went into the desert. He reached the same spot, but could see no sign of anyone. So raising his eyes to heaven as before, he prayed, Show me, O Lord, thy pure treasure, which thou hast concealed in the desert. Show me, I pray thee, the angel in the flesh, of which the world is not worthy. Then on the opposite bank of the river, her face turned toward the rising sun. He saw the the saint lying dead. Her hands were crossed according to custom, and her face was turned to the east. Running up, he shed tears over the saint's feet and kissed them, not daring to touch anything else. For a long time, he wept. Then, reciting the appointed psalms, he said the burial prayers and thought to himself, Must I bury the body of a saint, or will this be contrary to her wishes? And then he saw the words traced on the ground by her head, Abba Zosimus, bury on this spot the body of humble Mary. Return to dust that which is dust, and pray to the Lord for me, who am departed in the month of of Fermotan of of Egypt, called April by the Romans, on the first day, on the very night of our Lord's Passion, after having partaken of the divine mysteries. Reading this, the elder was glad to know the saint's name. He understood, too, that as soon as she had partaken of the divine mysteries on the shore of the Jordan, she was at once transported to the place where she died, the distance which Zosimus had taken 20 days to cover. Mary had evidently traversed in an hour and and had at once surrendered her soul to God. Then Zosimus thought, it is time to do as she wished. But how am I to dig a grave with nothing in my hands? And then suddenly nearby a small piece of wood left by some traveler in the desert. Picking it up, he began to dig the ground. But the earth was hard and dry and did not yield to the efforts of the elder. He grew tired and covered with sweat. He sighed from the depths of his soul and lifting up his eyes, he saw a big lion standing close to the saint's body and licking her feet. At the sight of the lion, he trembled with fear, especially when he called to mind Mary's words that she had never seen wild beasts in the desert. But guarding himself with the sign of the cross, the thought came to him that the power of the one lying there would protect him and keep him unharmed. Meanwhile, the lion drew nearer to him, expressing affection by every movement. Zosimus said to the lion, The great one ordered that her body was to be buried, but I am old, 
and have not the strength to dig the grave, for I have no spade in it, and it would take too long to go and get one. So can you carry out the work with your claws? Then we can commit to the earth the mortal temple of the saint. While he was still speaking, the lion with his front paws began to dig a hole deep enough to bury the body. Again, the elder washed the feet of the saint with his tears and calling on her to pray for all covered the body with earth in the presence of the lion. It was as if it had been It was as if it had been naked and uncovered by anything with a tattered cloak, which had been given to her by Zosimus, and with which Mary, turning away, had managed to cover part of her body. Then both departed. The lion went off into the desert, in the depth of the desert, like a lamb, while Zosimus returned to the monastery, glorifying and blessing Christ our Lord. And on reaching the monastery, he told all the brothers about everything. And all marveled on hearing of God's miracles. And with fear and love, they kept the memory of the saint. Abbot John, as St. Mary had previously told Abba Zosimus, found a number of things wrong in the monastery and got rid of them with the God's help. And St. Zosimus died in the same monastery, almost attaining the age of a hundred and passed to eternal life. The monks kept this story without writing it down and passed it on by word of mouth to one another. But I, as St. Sophronius, as soon as I heard it, wrote it down. Perhaps someone else better informed has already written the life of the saint. As far as I could, I recorded everything putting truth above all else. May God, who works amazing miracles, and generously bestows gifts on those who turn to him with faith, reward those who seek light for themselves in this story, who hear, read, and are zealous to write it. And may he grant them the lot of blessed Mary, together with all who at different times have pleased God by their pious thoughts and labors. And let us also give glory to God, the eternal King, that he may grant us too, his mercy in the day of judgment, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom belongs all glory, honor, and dominion and adoration with the eternal Father and the most holy, gracious, and life giving spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. In you, o Mother Mary, was restored the likeness of God. Carried your cross and followed Christ. You taught by your deeds how to spurn the body, for it passes away, and how to value the soul, for it is immortal. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy mortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy mortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy mortal one, have mercy on us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto each of the each, amen. All holy trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, forgive us our sins. Master, pardon our transgressions. Holy One, look upon us and heal our infirmities for your name's sake. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto each of each. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
both now and ever in a new ages of ages. Amen. She who once was devoted to vice and passion has today by penance become a bride of Christ, imitating the angels in her way of life, destroying the demons by the power of the cross. As O Mary, you appeared as a radiant bride in the kingdom of heaven. Lord have mercy, 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 Lord have merc
now that we are about to lie down to sleep. Grant us, O Master, the repose of our soul and body. Preserve us against the dark slumber of sin, against any impure satisfaction that roams about in the darkness of night. Quiet the assaults of our passions. Arrest the darts the evil one insidiously throws at us. Still the commotions of our flesh and calm all earthly and worldly feelings within us. Grant us, O Lord, a watchful mind, innocent thoughts, a sober heart, a gentle sleep free from evil dreams of the hour of prayer. Rouse us strong in the practice of your commands and ever mindful of your desires. Give us the grace to sing your glory throughout the night, to praise, bless, and glorify your honorable and magnificent name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. O oh, you, most glorious and ever virginal and blessed Theotokos, command our prayers to your Son, our God, and entreat him to save our souls through your intercession. The Father is my hope, the Son is my refuge, the Holy Spirit my protection. All Holy Trinity, glory to you. All oh, my hope I place in you, O Theotokos. Keep me under the wings of your protection. Glory to you, Christ God, our hope. Glory be to you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Give the blessing, Father, in the name of the Lord. May Christ, our true God, through the prayers of his spotless and all pure mother, of our glorious apostles, worthy of all praise, and of all the saints, have mercy on us and save us. For he is good and loves mankind. Amen. Bless me and forgive me, holy brethren, for I am a sinner. May God forgive you, holy Father. Let us pray for the peace of the world. Lord, have mercy for all pious and orthodox Christians. For our public authorities that they may be protected by God. Lord, have mercy. Mercy for our Father and Bishop Nicholas and for all of our brethren in Christ. Lord, have mercy. For those who are away from us, our parents and our brethren. Lord, have mercy. For those who have mercy on us and those who serve us. us unworthy as we are to pray for them. For those who hate us and those who love us. For the release of captives. For the travelers by sea, air, and land. For those afflicted with sickness, Lord, mercy. Let us pray also for the abundance of the fruits of the earth. Lord, mercy. For our parents and brethren departed from this life, for those who rest in this place and every other place. Pray also for ourselves. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. This concludes our Compline service and the annual reading of the life of St. Mary of Egypt. I want to thank all of those who participated this evening. May God bless you all. In you, our Mother Mary. For it is immortal, wherefore your soul is full.
sinners, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. All right, Father, are you ready for some questions and answers? I am, I am. Uh, again, it's a blessing to be able to pray with you, those that joined in on Sunday and those that are here now. Um, on, on almost like a practical end, noticed that uh, every time they turned in prayer, they turned toward the east, okay? That's not because I'm Eastern Catholic or Byzantine or anything like that. No, no, Christians have always historically prayed toward the rising of the sun because Jesus says that the coming of the Son of Man will be like the sun rising or the lightning shining from the east to the west. We also know that he is the light of the world. And so we... Um, Christians have always prayed facing toward the east, facing toward the east, uh, which is why some of you, the older generations with us, remember the old days and, and maybe some of the newer generation going to the Trinity Mass of our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, uh, will see the priest standing at the altar, much like you saw those that participated on Sunday or today as I stood and prayed with you. I hear sometimes, oh yeah, the old days when the priest turned his back on the people. The priest never in 2,000 years ever turned his back on anyone, at least any decent priest, okay? Uh, we turn our back on the devil, yes, but not on the people of God. No, no more than you turn your back on the person who's sitting behind you in church. We all, priest included, face the same way toward the Lord, awaiting his second coming. So Christians have always done this in anticipation of his second coming to pray all together toward the east, okay? So any good church built the proper way, pull on the compass, boom, guaranteed, facing east. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing I've asked, some people have asked in the past sometimes, after a life like that, when she had to go to confession, you know, where there's a little line there may be missed by some people. It says, when she went in to behold the Holy Cross, she also beheld the mysteries of the Lord. That's a, that's kind of, that's a Christian way of saying in the, in, the, in the East, we say the Holy Mysteries, huh? The Eucharist, the Confession, and so these are the Holy Mysteries of the Church. So she certainly availed herself of Holy Confession, receiving Holy Communion, and then making her way out to the desert. Um, that's the second thing. Ah, I know the third one is a fun one for all of you. You notice how they gave the sign of peace. They certainly did give the sign of peace. But if you want to give the sign of peace in the Church the old way, huh? And they kiss each other on the lips. So, you know, for all my brothers and sisters that want to restore the sign of peace in the church, all right, we'll bring it back, but let's bring it back the right way. Old-timey way. You want the sign of peace in the church? We'll give each other a kiss on the lips. What do you think about that, huh? Kelsey. Great. Um, Father, I have a question um, from myself, actually. We do have a couple coming in, but... Is the is the location of where St. Mary of Egypt is buried, where she was buried, is that known now? I don't know if the spot where she was buried is known. What I do, what I do know is that the location where St. Zosimus met her, uh, uh, just on the other side of the Jordan River, is certainly known. And there's a church there built. This whole story, by the way, happens in Jordan. So Rhonda Hussein and others from Jordan, the, uh, the Suedans and others, uh, that are here tonight, members of my parish, uh, know quite well the Church of St. Mary of Egypt. Um, all, the other thing that is known, by the way, is the location where Mary found herself outside the Church of the Anastasis, known also as the Holy Sepulchre. The place where the icon of the Mother of God was placed is still there. And the icon of the Mother of God that she saw is still there. You can still go to it. It's most Pilgrims have no idea it's there, but down, there's a side door that you have to go in and oh, around and around and in, in a little thing. And then the icon is there. And of course, it's a, the local Christians. It's the, it's the church of the local Christians that are there. Um, and uh, it's beautiful. Well, the Greek Orthodox have the big cathedral inside the church of the Holy Sepulchre and everybody else. The local Palestinian Christians have their church right there. And um, it's not accessed from inside the Holy Sepulchre, but by another door. And the icon is still there. Very beautiful. Greg Kupek is writing in and is wondering if you can explain what um, behind you, what those two like sunburst like things oh, that are on the other side of the cross. 
Greg wants a uh, church tour. <laughs> <laughs> I love church tours. One of my favorite things. Yeah, uh, sure. Though my son's going to grab those, grab one of them, and then I'm going to ask you what they look like, guys. Come on. All right, Roman Catholics, what do they kind of look like? Come, Kelsey, what do they kind of look like? Kind of like a monstrance? Yeah, kind of like a monstrance, but it's not a monstrance, okay? Okay, I'm going to do, here, watch, son, you got to come over here. He's going to be my, my guy here. Watch, stand right there. <laughs> what are they? Fans. They're fans. Now, okay, this religion is getting even stranger, right? Because, yeah, uh, they're fans because Jesus is the Christ. He's the king. So, of course, wherever the king goes, his servants go there to fan him. But, of course, he's not just the earthly king, but the divine king. And so on the fans are the wings of the angels. When we celebrate the liturgy, we are taken up into the heavenly liturgy. And so the, the acolytes play, stand in the role of the angels who, who surround the throne of God. From the book of Ezekiel, in which he sees the vision of the throne of God. And around him, all of the angels are their wings are doing like this, whoosh, and the, the sound is like a roar okay, coming forth from the throne of God. And so we walk always, wherever the gospel book goes, the Holy Eucharist, wherever, keep the holy fans and remind us that Jesus is our king. Um, Teresa Cotter is writing in, and she, she says, the compliment was beautiful. Is it prayed every evening, like in the Roman divine office, evening prayer? Uh, compl- yes, it is. Yeah, it is. When it can be, when it can be, it's part of the divine services. And so in some of the smaller parishes, um, now, okay, Vatican II tried as best it could to restore the office to its proper place among the faithful. And its proper place among the faithful is part of the public prayer of the church. Okay, now, unfortunately, unfortunately, the directives of Vatican II have still not been followed. And the situation is this, that many faithful do pray the office, but most often it's prayed privately by the person. The office is not designed as a private prayer. It's designed as a public prayer of the church. It is part of the divine liturgy. So matins, uh, vespers, compline, and all the, these are the public prayers of the church. Vatican II tried to call the church back, say, hey, guys, look, these, this, this service of the, of the office, keeping the holy hours, let's, keep, let's make sure we know what we're talking about, are the hours of the day. Remember, God sanctified the hours of the day by making note of the setting of the sun and the rising of the sun the next day in the book of Genesis. So the Jewish people and also the Christians always keeping the hours of the day to sanctify the hours of the day as God, as God had intended with creation. Um, and so we chant the Psalms during the, during the office. So what happens in most of our churches? And I'm going to speak to my Roman Catholic brothers and sisters for a minute. What is prayed publicly apart from the mass most often? The rosary, yes? Yeah. But the rosary is a private prayer. It's not the public office of the church. So what needs to happen is a restoration in our churches of, of, the, of the kind of proper order of the services and the proper place of those services in the life of the church. In every one of our churches, there should be vespers going on on a regular basis, especially Saturday evening. What happens in your church on Saturday evening? Well, we have Saturday evening mass. What about vespers? You can't climb the mountain of God out of breath. You know, if the Eucharist is a source and summit of our life, it's way up here. Well, you got to get up there. And the office is the stepladder by which we get there, okay? So we need to work to restore the office. This is why, by the way, at the Institute of Catholic Culture, we oftentimes have Compline or, a, 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 you know, Latari Sunday Vespers, things like that. Because, and people are, what's this all about? What's this thing? I've never seen this before in my church. Well, we're just following the directives of the church. That's all. It's just that we're the, one of the few places we're trying to follow it. So, yes, the, the Compline is prayed regularly, especially during Lent, when we have more services. Our community is very small. So, we don't have services every single day, every single night. But when we do, we have Compline, Vespers, uh, Orthros, or known as Matins. Uh, these services are prayed regularly with the chanters, Reader Fred, Reader Steve, uh, assisting in the chanting of these services. Um, all of our services are sung, all of them. Uh, reading, like I read the Life of Mary of Egypt, very unusual. That's one of the few times in the entire year that a text is actually just read in the church. Even the readings and gospel always chanted. Yeah. 
Okay, along these same lines, um, Gerald is writing in and asking this question, which I admit I don't know what this term is, but he is asking, why does the Byzantine Compline not have the nunc dimittis in the service, but St. Mary yeah, does now, say it in the uh, reading? Yeah, it's the prayer of St. Simeon, right? Now you shall uh, let your servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen thy salvation, right? Um, a light of revelation of the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. Anyways, no, that prayer is prayed by us at Vespers, at Vespers, not at Compline. Okay, Vespers being evening prayer, Compline being night prayer before you go to bed. Okay, another Compline-related question coming in from Hannah, and she is wondering, one of the chantings you said is the Lord have mercy, then followed by Kyrie eleison, and then she said there was another phrase after that that she didn't recognize. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, in Greek, English, Arabic. In our, okay, in our liturgy, we pray according to the language of the people. And so in our tradition, uh, we pray in, uh, in, well, in English, because we're in America, in Arabic, because most of our people are from the Middle East, um, and, uh, um, and in Greek, because, uh, yeah, some of our people still speak Greek, and, uh, and we receive our liturgy from Constantinople, and so we still pray in Greek, Arabic, and English. If you were to go to Mexico, for example, it wouldn't be, our English part would be in Spanish. So always according to the spoken language. Some people say, oh, we are, the mass should be in Latin because it's the, it's the, it's, you know, it's the old timey sacred language. Well, I'll grant you old timey sacred language from liturgy. I'm into like the these and the thous. Yes. Okay. But you know, Latin was the vulgar language, right? The Latin Vulgate. It was the spoken language of the people. Before the mass was in Latin, it was in Greek which, of course, was also the spoken language of the people, okay? So while I love Latin, I do, I do, I promise you. Intro ibo al alatari dei, a deum qui la tibica, iuba tutamim, iuda kemeo stei shekas, and so forth, right? Pater nostra, quies in celi, santifice to nomen. I love Latin, so no one crucify me for not loving Latin. I do, but it's proper place. English should be used in the liturgy. The spoken language, well, I should say the spoken language of the people should be used in the liturgy. And... The venerable languages that we have received should also be used in part. This is exactly what Sacro Sanctum Concilium in Vatican II was calling for. Not a new mass, by the way, not a new mass, but a translation of the mass, which was in Latin, which was no longer the vulgar or the, the spoken language, but into the various languages of God's people. Again, I love Latin. Please, Institute of Catholic Culture, I don't want to see you see 400 emails tomorrow. You know, I love Latin. I sing in my church in Latin on Pascha, on Easter. We have a beautiful hymn that we sing on Easter. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in tombs bestowing life. And at the end of singing it in English, in Arabic, in Greek, then my wife, Puria Linda, and I, who come from a Latin or Roman Catholic background, baptized Roman Catholic, we sing it together in Latin. Bob, did you have a question? And do you want to just go ahead and unmute yourself? Father, as I was listening to uh, the uh, reading of uh, St. Mary of Egypt, I noticed two things. Uh, number one, uh, you know, when she prayed, you know, to the icon uh, for forgiveness, uh, she was admitted to the church. She was forgiven her sins there, uh, yet she repented in the desert. Uh, so I was wondering uh, if you had any thoughts on that. Oh, I do have some good, some juicy thoughts on that one. Yeah, I certainly do. Um you know, it's oftentimes thought that the penance that the priest oftentimes gives is um, like the sufficient repentance for our sins. But this is not the case. The penance that you say that the priest gives you is a token to show the priest and come before the Lord to say, I am not coming to this confession for magic, but because I have true repentance in my heart. And I begin that now. Right, you know, I, uh, I I I yelled at my, my my wife. I lost my temper with my kids. I you know I did you know who knows I fornicated. God forbid. I looked at impure images and I got three Hail Marys. This is the beginning, the seed of a change of our life by which we then go about fixing what's wrong. Okay, and so I, I would encourage uh, this. This I'm glad you brought that brought this question up. Uh, it, this is it's super important. You know, if you've had a, an issue with your brother, your with your 
you know, I mean, brother, right? Christian brother with your spouse or whoever it is. You got to go and, and make it right. You got to go get it right. So it, maybe you've gone to confession, but now it's time to get it right. I, I think this time period that we're living in right now, it's like, it's I really, it, it's a, it's a terrible situation, but you know, God brings good out of evil situations, doesn't he? As, as he did for Joseph in, in, in Egypt, as Joseph said, right to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Okay. This situation we're living in is certainly illness, sickness, people dying. This is an evil situation. Uh, but it is given to us by God for our good. It's allowed by God for our good. So I would encourage you to take that time now. So, you know, during this Lenten season, I, like Mary of Egypt, am exiled from the Holy Mysteries. From the Holy Mysteries. Um, let me begin to get my relationships right. You know, is, 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 are you estranged from your brother or your sister, from a friend of yours that maybe you had a break, a break with years ago? Maybe that relationship has kind of like become like concrete, just like broken and unable. You know, maybe God forbid a, a, a divorce happened, um, something like that. Now is the time to get it right. Maybe a letter, maybe a phone call uh, to say I'm sorry. I, to the extent that I had anything to do with this, with this breaking of this relationship, I, I'm sorry. And I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for your forgiveness. It's so important. We do not let our lives become, become identified by division. Why do I say that? The Lord lives a life of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a life of relationship from all eternity, and we are made in his image and likeness. That means that our relationships with our spouse, our relationships with our neighbor, with our brother, with our sister, with our friend, are given to us by God. They're created by God for one reason, so that in our relationships, we might reveal to the world the love of God who lives in all for all eternity in our relationship. She says, we are meant to be the revelation of the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when I break my relationship with my brother, whether I'm right or he's wrong, he's right or whoever's wrong, if I don't make an effort to restore that relationship, then I allow the evil one who hates more than anything the revelation of God's love on this earth, he hates it more than anything. I allow him to be the defining one of revelation on this earth, the revelation of God. Don't you ever let Christians that be the case. No way. No way. Maybe my brother did something against me. It's time for me to go to him and say, the situation, it, it hurt, and, but I come before you, and the part that I played in this, I am sorry, and I want to restore our relationship so that we, we here, between the two of us, the three of us, the four of us, the five, might be revealed to the world God's love and forgiveness. Because otherwise, what's my, what's my life worth? Seriously, all of it is worth absolutely nothing if that is not the defining character of my life. We have one, one last question. Frank is writing in, and he's wondering, in monastic terms, would St. Mary of Egypt have been considered a hermit? He thinks, don't most hermits partake of the Holy Mysteries more frequently than she did, or do some need to be separate for a long time? This is a this is a good I, you know the hermit distinction between a hermit and, a, and this guy and the brother and the so forth. It's not really distinctions that are known exact. I mean, uh, known you know known but not stressed in the East. She was look. She was a um, she was I don't know you know a monastic. What does a monastic mean? One who lives alone. Okay. And as far as the question of receiving the holy mysteries are concerned, you know I think it's important that we it may be a time of correction for us in our conceptions. Of, uh, of the life of the church. I think Mary of Egypt is a good example of that. You know, we read the story of St. Zosimus and those monks. What did they do at the beginning of Lent? They left the monastery and headed out in the desert for 40 days. For 40 days, they self-imposed an exile from the Holy Mysteries. Okay? That's what all, that's, that was, the monks of Palestine did that. That was their thing that they did. And some still do that, actually, in, in Palestine, say, in the monastery of St. Sabas and other places. Not leaving the church without the prayers, but, but exiling themselves for a time so as to grow in their desire for the Lord. 
Notice after all of those years, what was the one thing Mary desired more than anything else? It's communion. That deep desire brought her to the place where she literally died to herself, right? The complete transformation by the reception of Holy Communion to enter into eternal life in that moment. So I would just encourage everyone, you know, our concept of, of, uh, of maybe of a, a, a constant reception of communion, where I go to Mass, everybody goes up to communion. Every time I go, I go to communion. I think this is a little reality check, guys. This has not been the way it's been in the church uh, at all times, okay? Um, and, and certainly, I'll tell you, the big problem is this. You're going to be surprised at my answer on this one. The big problem are the pews. These benches that they have in churches, those are all Protestant, by the way. Those are not in apostolic churches up to about the 500s, and they're still not proper to our Orthodox tradition. If you go to a well-appointed Orthodox church, no benches, okay? Why? We don't sit down to do the work of God. We stand up, okay? Uh, so even like in my church, in St. George, in our church during Lent, at least, we remove all the chairs from the church for the weeknight services. We just go, we stand in the church, in an attention, awaiting the action of God. Um, uh, but why am I bringing up the pews? Because here's what happens. Everybody stands up, and everybody gets in a line and goes to communion. And if I sit down, it feels rather uncomfortable. They're stumbling over me. Why isn't she going to communion? Why isn't he going to communion? Like, he must be a real, real bad guy. You know? Now, this was not the way it was. Communion was distributed completely differently. No chairs, no pews in the church. Then it came time for communion, and people would approach the, the altar rail in the, in, the, in, the, in the Western tradition, or in our tradition, they'd approach the holy doors, the iconostasis, and, and then a communion was distributed to those that, 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 that approached, and by the way, were known by the priest, known by the priest by name. So if you come to my church, for the most part, as best I possibly can, I distribute communion to the faithful by name. You know, Peggy comes, the handmaiden of God, Peggy, receives the precious body and blood of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ for the remission of her sins and unto life everlasting. Amen. To each person. And, and because if I don't know you, I'm not giving you communion. How do I know that you're an Orthodox Christian? How do I know that you're in a good state as a Catholic? Only because I have a relationship with you, I know you've gone to confession, and I, you know, and by the way, in our tradition, we go to confession before the icon of Jesus, standing side by side with the priest. I know the people going to confession, and um, that they're prepared properly. I had to stop somebody in line the other day. You know, are you a baptized, confirmed Christian, you know, a Catholic, in good state in the church? I'm not going to give the holy mysteries to somebody for their for their for their ill for their death, as Saint Paul says. Some people are dying, not receiving properly. God forbid I would do something like that as a priest. So um, I have no idea why I'm saying what I'm saying right now. What was the question, Kelsey? The question was whether we um, would consider St. Mary of Egypt a hermit. And Oh, yeah, I don't know. So you know, their, their practices were different about when they received communion and didn't receive communion. There, She was certainly a monastic once she headed out there. Very mono, you know, mono, astro, okay, the monastic, so I don't know. Yeah, she's a hermit, I guess. I don't know, I know the answer to that question. Thank you all. God bless you. Please remember to, to pray for all for everyone. We hold each other up in prayer, carry each other like the, the paralytic being carried to the foot of Christ for our healing. Okay. May God bless you all. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.